You're listening to the MS Power User Podcast. This is episode 031, recorded Thursday, January 19th of 2017. Each week, we discuss the latest news about Microsoft, including Surface, Xbox, Holographic, Mobile, and of course, Windows. Today, we're going to dig into a new build and talk about some mostly just insider stuff, kind of the state of insider, and we'll just touch on the death of cash. My name is Vernon E.L. Smith. Since the beginning of this show, we've had Andrew Bennett as the more youthful half of the show. Tonight, he's taking a well-deserved episode off, and filling in is my friend and a very smart Windows person. Now, there's got to be a better way to introduce him here, but uh, Aaron Hall. Aaron, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm pretty good, actually. It's my wife's birthday tomorrow, and I oh, scrambled... Wonderful. I scrambled to get her a, a series of gifts, and hopefully, I can roll them out to her in a in a um, marital maritally maritally pleasing manner. Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> I hope so as well. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> so, yeah, um, how has your week been? Uh, it's been a pretty busy week at work and stuff. Uh, I've been working on a project moving a bunch of uh, exchange mailboxes around, so fun times. Mm. Uh, but uh, also beyond that, my wife and I are uh, in the process of buying our first home. That's uh, awesome. So we're very excited about that. Everything's going very well and very smooth for, you know, for first time buying process. So very excited about it. Well, even after several times, it doesn't get less stressful. Believe me, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's a pain, but it's um, it's always worth it as long as you keep your priorities straight. Yep, absolutely. So, yep. Well, I am so thrilled to have you on. I'm so glad you were able to change your schedule around and uh, get in on last minute's notice. Unfortunately, listeners, Andrew Bennett, he is fine himself, but he has some pretty heavy family things going on right now and we really do wish him the best of luck and and uh god's blessings and everything in as, as what he's dealing with right now so please send him your your good tidings and well wishes we are going to start with another build last episode we finished off with uh the 007 build 15007 which had a lot of good stuff in it and already again this week, well, it's Thursday this of, of the week already. And just, I guess, I don't know what time it dropped, but today, uh, 15.014 dropped for Fast Ring. Aaron, are you running this already? Uh, I am waiting for it to prepare to install on both my 950XL and my Surface Book. In fact, actually, the Surface Book just prompted me to reboot, so it's obviously going to have to wait. <laughs> Okay. Well, that was the question I was going to ask you. What hardware are you running? And, uh, well, you alluded to them already. Which builds? Yep. I, I have a Surface Book that I run the fast build on, so it's on 15.007 right now. And I have a 950XL Lumia uh, that is also on the fast build. Uh, and I am uh, it's actually ready to restart now, so I'll restart it and we'll let it update in real time. Okay. And that's uh, that's everything you use, or you have a, a dedicated work machine as well, or that I do have book, a dedicated. Yeah, no, I have a dedicated uh, Dell. Um, let's see, it's a Dell Latitude seventy three fifty. It's one of their uh, two in ones. It's maybe about a year or two old uh, that I use at work, uh, and mm -hmm. that runs uh, Windows ten Anniversary Edition on the stable branch. Okay. I'm curious, do you have the option to, since you are the <laughs> the guiding hand in IT there, do you have the option to put that on a, a newer version if you want to? I do have the option to do it, but uh, since it is for my work system, I generally tend to opt out of that since I have a personal device that I can do the testing on. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember you had... Um, I don't remember what it was, but you before you went to the Surface Book, you were pretty satisfied with what you had anyway. And it was, uh, I remember like the, uh, if I recall right, it was kind of a, a, um, a push and pull in your mind of whether to get the Surface Book mm -hmm. or not. 
Yeah, I had the uh, Surface Pro 3 prior to the book, and uh, I loved it. I, I absolutely love the Surface Pro form factor. Um, there's nothing about it that I don't love. Um, the book, I really, really like it a lot, but I don't love it. And it's not because of the book, anything wrong with the book. Um, it's just that I just personally prefer the smaller, more portable form factor. Um, I actually am a longtime tablet PC user, um, so I, I have always enjoyed that actual tablet functionality. Uh, so I and I find it more productive to use tablet is as the uh, Surface Pro Four form factor versus the clipboard of the book. Hmm. Just a just a preference, though. I mean, uh, the book is absolutely an incredible piece of hardware and. I'm really looking forward to see what they do to innovate it for the next generation. Hmm. And would you say that, well, first of all, do you, do you dock the book or did you dock the Pro 3? I docked both of them. I do have the uh, both the original dock and the new dock, the, which is more like a port replicator, I guess. But, um, but I do use both of those or have used both of those, and I uh, find the experience to be very uh, empowering. Um, I feel, ha or I've had no trouble using my book or the Pro 3 as a, you know, a full desktop replacement. Nice. And what would be some of the most, um, I guess, uh, resource intensive tasks that you would use on there? Um, honestly, that, you, yeah. Well, honestly, the what I use for my personal uh, usage these days, I am 95% universal apps at this point i even use the office mobile apps full time uh, on the book um, nice. i the only desktop apps i install are paint.net and i use powershell and i use audacity um, beyond that i don't use any uh you know win 32 apps anymore um, which is pretty telling i think overall of what microsoft is doing with the universal apps platform um not to say they don't have any uh, room for criticism there, because if you follow me on Twitter, you know that uh, I have uh, ranted and raved plenty on the topic, but um, especially recently. But uh, but yeah, I do mostly use universal apps uh, at this point. At work, it's a different story. Um, I am probably 95% desktop apps there. Um, but, you know, so I use a lot of... Uh, uh, IT administrative tools um, between PowerShell, Remote Desktop, uh, vCenter Manager for VMware um, for my enterprise uh, virtual environment and uh, System Center and let's see, Exchange Management Console, all the Active Directory tools. The list goes on and on. But um, And of course, the desktop office apps on top of all that. So, mm -hmm. hmm. What... Um... What other, if any other, uh, branded Microsoft products do you use? I don't remember if you use an Xbox or not. Uh, yeah, I've got the Xbox One S that's out here in my living room uh, on the on my bigger TV. And then I have in the bedroom, I've got the original Xbox One. It's actually a day one edition uh, oh, nice. that I've got in my bedroom on a smaller TV. Uh, so it's nice if on the weekends that my wife and I can sit in bed and lounge uh, while we watch TV and stuff. If we want to just have a quiet movie night in and we're both just feeling kind of tired and lazy. So, and I guess I've never really got the impression you were that big of a gamer. Is that the case or is it more of just, you're using this for um, like, which way do you lean with these consoles? So I used to game a lot. Um, but in probably the last, I'd say, five to six years, my gaming has dropped uh, dramatically. Uh, and I really only play maybe two or three games per year. Um, and they're almost always Final Fantasy or some other type of RPG-related game. Um, so, like, for example, uh, from... The, or for the month of December, I put in 120 hours of gaming on Final Fantasy 15, which, by the way, I loved. Um, I really enjoyed it, um, both as a longtime fan of the franchise and as uh, 
an RPG fan. Um, I think what they did with it, even though it's more action oriented uh, than RPG traditional type of gameplay, what they did with it was a lot of fun and very enjoyable. So, uh, I but yeah, like 120 some hours I think on playing that, um, and that was done in one month. <laughs> wow. So nice. yeah, I had some extra time over the holidays. So cool. Well, to finish off the little about you section, everyone, or at least many people I know, want to know the Windows Phone lineage. Uh, <laughs> when did you get started? And maybe list off at least a, a few of your phones. I have always been a Windows Mobile guy since the Sprint Mogul days back in Windows Mobile 5.0. Um, nice. The only time I have deviated from that was when the HTC Evo Android phone came out uh, years ago. I think it was maybe 2009, I want to say. Sounds right. I spent six months using it and hated every moment of it. <laughs> um, I loved the hardware, but I hated the OS. Um, so as soon as Windows Mobile 7 came out, um, I switched to, let's see, what did I use? I used the HTC Touch Pro 7 when that came out. Um, from there, I went to the HTC Titan. The Touch Pro 6 on 6.5? Uh, no, the, the Touch Pro 7 with uh, Windows Phone 7. Oh, on Sprint. Oh, okay. Yep, I'm on sorry. Sprint. Yes, yep. yes. Okay. Uh, and then I, I got sick of Sprint and went to AT&T to get the HTC Titan. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... I liked the Titan, but I didn't like the fact that it was kind of buggy uh, firmware on it, and HTC never released any updates at all. So uh, the Lumia 920 uh, came out, and I switched to Lumia from there, where I did Lumia 920, 1020, uh, and then the 1520, and then I went back to the 1020 for a while. Uh, and then I did, let's see, 930 uh, that I imported internationally. Loved the hardware, but hated the battery life because of, and lack of 4G. So then I went 830. Yeah. Uh, loved it. Uh, and then I went from the 830 to the 640 XL. And then I went, got the 950 XL. Nice. So. Similar, yeah, I didn't start quite as early as you. I started in Windows Mobile 6.1, but then a pretty similar lineage along there. So the Titan 2, I'd say, was my favorite uh, feeling device as far as a piece of hardware. But anyway, let's not dwell on that. The, the days of old, right? Yeah. We have we have new stuff coming up here. Like I said, the uh, uh, Fast Ring build 15.014. And first of all, the ebooks come into the store. Um, MS Power User actually had that exclusive, so that is uh, that's pretty good. And I must say that we had a uh, the site had a little bit of a shout out a shout out on a pretty big podcast, uh, just saying a little bit of kudos to MS Power User for having some pretty good scoops lately. So, congrats to the people from the site, which are, I am not included in as far as getting the scoops. <laughs> uh, I get very few scoops and certainly not very uh, notable at that. Um, Aaron, what's uh, what do you think of this eBooks thing? I think it's pretty exciting. Um, uh, uh, I, th I don't do a lot of reading, but a lot of my members uh, or family members do. And uh, so I know they'll be excited to be able to see this opportunity come to their surface usage as well. Uh, my mom in particular, she's got a, uh, sh um, a uh, Kindle fire that she is aging and she was looking to get rid of it. But uh, because of the kind of the lack of uh, Kindle fire support, uh, on Windows, she's been kind of struggling there. Well, I think she'll enjoy this if uh, if it takes off and they get a good library going with it. You know, I I really since the that well known podcast shouted out to us directly, I will credit them. It was Windows Weekly. It was uh, Mary Jo Foley who said, uh, "Great job to MS Power User lately." So, well, some of the things about the eBooks here. It's going to provide a interactive reading experience, of course. Um, use the uh, 
let's see, it, it's basically stored in a new hub entry in Microsoft Edge uh, in your books library. It's a new new entry in, in part of your favorites history download that, that that type of stuff right there. That's new, but uh, great. Um, you can, let's see, I guess I can just read through here. This can be the different learning tools. You can widen text spacing to prove to improve fluence, reading fluency and benefit from topography tailored to reading efficiency. Um, that's a good thing, I suppose, and it's not something I'd ever really thought of. And of course, customize it uh, directly for you. Um, has the Edge has a has a digital content. It, Edge is built for reading digital content on Windows 10 devices. Um, of course, you can change the font and text size. There's themes, navigation control, stuff like that. And EPUB support, that's uh, important as well. Not just PDF files or um, or books purchased via the store. You can read any unprotected ebook in the EPUB file format with Edge. So this is, it's a great feature to throw in there, but I really don't know how Microsoft plans to compete i think it's just kind of a youtube feature if even that i don't um i really don't see what how this is going to be an incredible benefit aside from just like a me too thing like i said yeah i kind of wonder uh what their uh, publisher support is going to end up being like i hope it's successful obviously but uh i honestly don't know what to expect uh from publishers so and of course, Amazon is the, the king in this area. And I wonder that perhaps, possibly, it comes down to uh, some of the OEMs wanting, want, asking for this because they want to have, they want to come up with, they want to compete with the Amazon, like the, the Kindle, for example. Yeah, it could very even well though, be. Even though I really don't think people are buying Kindles anymore, I mean, in mass that I'm aware of, but... Um, I don't know. Um, wh whatever. I mean, it's just it's one more thing to, to to feature to put in there, and I'm glad we were able to hear about it a little bit early uh, last. I don't remember what day it was last week. We heard about this. Um, uh, I think Mahidi had the screenshots of it, and of course now we see that it is uh, official. Yep. Well, official insider fast ring. So. Yep. So next up we have color acts uh, accent colors yay yeah, is this so uh trip your trigger aaron it, it actually does i'm pretty excited about this one i asked for this one uh myself uh i don't know two years ago when the uh windows insider program first launched i was like this is such a no-brainer why can i not just type in a you know an rgb hex or whatever color code and have exactly the color i want um, and I've been waiting two years for this, so I'm very excited about it. Um, just in case anybody wonders, uh, hex value 336699, my favorite color of all time. It's a kind of a, a, a bluish tint to it, um, but I have always loved that color shade for some reason, and I can't wait to apply that to all of my devices everywhere. Maybe I'll send you that for, my, for your birthday sometime, Aaron. <laughs> That's actually an easy one to remember. That's uh, um, yeah. oddly, oddly, um, I guess, memorable color number. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's that's good for people who care about that. And uh, I guess if I wasn't colorblind, I probably would <laughs> care about it more. But um, I know it makes some people happy. That's good. It does. I mean, I, I it's one more way of showing that they're giving the power of choice to the user, which is to me very important. Uh, yeah, that is very important. Speaking of color, there is a lighter shade in Cortana's search box on the PC. Uh, they just say, we're experimenting with a new look for Cortana's search bo box on the taskbar. Let us know what you think. Yeah, and um, I already saw a, a screenshot of somebody posting it and it's it's a big white box uh, now, and it doesn't fit with the dark theme. Hmm. It's kind of weird now. I mean, on the light theme, looks great. Can't can't argue that. But on the dark theme, it just really now it looks like a stands out like a sore thumb. So. Well, Aaron, I think you know I'm team dark theme all Absolutely. the way. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> 
or at least uh you know everything to be theme uh, theme specific so and yeah uh, and personally i am just glad that i keep cortana as icon only so yeah that's i know i'm really surprised that people still have that search box in there but well it it, it was i thought it was there more of as an indicator and to draw people in and a reminder hey this new thing is here try it i think and so of course too. This, yeah and i don't really know of anyone who still uses that but i don't to be to be honest in my circles my my daily life i don't know a lot of people running windows 10 just because of where i work and and uh my circle of friends my <laughs> face-to-face circle of friends so we also have bigger text in notifications for Cortana. Um, that's good, I suppose. Yeah, I'm looking forward uh, to see what that looks like. Automatically freeing up space, saving extra step when you're low on space. We've added a new option in storage settings to automatically get rid of the files you don't need. Currently, we've, we support this for unused temporary files and items you have that have been in your recycle bin for 30 days. Options off by default, but you can turn it on under system, storage settings, and choose what it cleans up. And that this seems a seems like a no-brainer as well. Yeah, and I'm but I'm the the key words for me is choose what it cleans up. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm actually pretty excited about that one. I like the thought of what it does, but you know how it is with automatically doing things without user consent. I'm glad that it's off by default and I'm yeah. glad that you can choose what it does. Um, I think that that was a smart decision on their part. Um, are you following along on the site here? Do you see the next one? Yep. What do you, you want to cover this one? I don't know what I'm missing with this. Yeah, I'm not really sure yet either. Although hopefully my phone I'll get, will I'll give you the hard updating. ones. Yeah. Um, merged Wi-Fi settings under Wi-Fi services section in the settings app, PC and mobile. Uh, we have combined some of the advanced Wi-Fi settings. Wi-Fi Sense and paid Wi-Fi services have been merged into a single section entitled simply Wi-Fi services under settings and network and inter excuse me network and internet Wi-Fi. Now, while you may not see Wi-Fi Sense in quotes uh, mentioned, the feature is still there as the connect to suggested open hotspots. So, why do you think why wi-fi wow uh do you think that they are changing it to wi-fi services am i, so, am I just missing something no i think that this is a um i think it's a political change on this one um i'm not sure if you recall when windows 10 first launched but wi-fi sense was a much bigger feature oh yeah uh in which you not only did would it automatically connect to advertised public hotspots that it knew about but it would learn because it would try to share you had the option to share at least uh, your wi-fi connections with people in your own social circle let, let me let me pause for a second have you ever gotten it to work i did get that feature to work i had it, I had it work once <laughs> yeah, i had that feature works uh with my my wife and i at and uh so it worked fairly well uh, in my experience. However, I know, did hear from a lot of people that it didn't work um, very well. So that's probably part of why they took it out. But the other one was the fact that people were scared of it. Um, yeah. It was advertised yeah. by a lot of clickbait news outlets that uh, it was a scary feature because why are you sharing my wi-fi password microsoft sharing wi-fi password right but, but they <laughs> like, really? but that was it they didn't it was an ad hoc solution that was actually very secure if you understood the technical uh way it was designed uh so it's a shame that that was killed off in my opinion and most most of wi-fi sense at least the way that i got the most use out of it was that it would automatically log me in to free Wi-Fi. Right. You would just put in a dummy email password, that stuff like that. It actually it actually um, defaulted a just fake phone number for you, yep. <laughs> which was really nice. Exactly. Um, and and so when they killed off the, the sharing functionality, they kind of rebranded it as this connect to suggested open hotspots instead of Wi-Fi sense in order to kind of distance themselves from the controversy of that name. Um, and so I think that this, you know, changing it to Wi-Fi services, 
is both a consolidation and simplification of the Wi-Fi settings dialog or you know box, um, but also further distancing from that controversy. At least that's my opinion. Yeah. Now I I know that going forward Microsoft has they've already announced it. I don't know if it's active yet, where. They, they are selling or they will be selling cellular data. They're going to be a broker for that. If there's there must be a yep. better way to describe that. That is the so, paid Wi-Fi services component. Okay. So it is, I mean, I thought what they were offering was pretty specifically cellular or well, no, no, none of it is cellular anymore, but over the air, not um, a, what we would think of as Wi-Fi. Are they the same? Um, as far as I know, they are technically the same. Uh, I, I'm not really qualified enough to explain it uh, very well, I don't think. But, um, but yeah, essentially, uh, the paid Wi-Fi services and the uh, that over-the-air services kind of functions the same way from an end-user perspective. Okay. Well, I'll leave it at that. It, it's just maybe that is... Maybe that's why they're calling they're changing it from Wi-Fi settings to Wi-Fi services. Maybe hinting at this new, well, the service, paid service, basically. But I thought for sure that that would have been under cellular, that they would have had a a, a, a hook to pull you in for their own cellular service. Anyway, we'll we'll see. Uh, new power sli power slider on select Windows 10 devices. Um, it's going to help improve battery life of Windows devices. It's a continuation of the battery life work in the creator's update. And some will see a new power slider, a new slider in the power flyout on the taskbar. Um, it's only enabled on select PCs and it's not, it's not yet wired up for performance or power settings. We've enabled it to get early feedback, they've said. So this is, I think it makes it just a lot easier. Hey, do you want you know, power sipping or power hungry, you know, performance or battery life, I think. And just to, you know, not, not just toggle one or the other on or off, but to kind of pick different gradients between there, that makes sense to me. And I think it, it's going to become, it's going to, well, for one, it's going to make a relatively novice user feel more like a, a less novice or you know like a, a more of a, mm -hmm. a power user be go, oh well I, i'm gonna dial him i'm setting up my pc just how i want it and i want to get the most out of it this way or that way or whatever yeah and um i think i like that and especially that it's a graphical and having a slider is more uh akin to you know it it it, it ties into touch a lot better it's it works better in the touch interface I think it'll, um, I think it'll still work fairly well for mouse users as well, which is important, yeah. of course. But but I do actually like this. It's a much faster way rather than having to dig into you know eight different battery and power options screens in order to set these things. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Um, and it, it actually, I think the what they the screenshot that they show looks very good. You know, I think it's designed well, and I, I like that presentation. Uh, it looks like it's designed so that if you slide it all the way to the left, it'll automatically put it into battery saver mode and or turn that function on and, uh, you know, preserve the battery as best it can. If you slide it all the way to the right, it aims for best performance, uh, and it'll ramp up. Uh, pres presumably, over long term, it's going to enable a lot of, processor optimizations and memory optimizations in order to speed up and get every last ounce of power out of your system. Now this is incredibly similar to the previous builds uh, announcement of game mode. Yeah. Which really was just optimization of, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say it's quite the same thing. Uh, how do I say this? Game mode was shutting off all the other stuff that you don't want to mess with your CPU and then will be uh, it really allow that that device to focus on getting the most uh, performance for the game. Whereas this could be a little bit, I mean, it's basically the same thing, just uh, maybe approached from a different angle. Yeah, I think it'll be very similar. Uh, game mode might be a separate thing that you launch from the Xbox app, for example. And I'm just guessing here, but 
but it might be something you launched from the Xbox app and then that does further tuning in order to say, okay, yeah, let's target the performance for what's appropriate for gaming. So, hmm. Well, moving into what's fixed, I'm not going to cover everything, but scrolling down the list, one really stuck out at me. And this is, this is from Microsoft. Quote, some of our more nerdy insiders will notice that build branch strings and timestamps have been replaced with static values in the version resources of OS binaries. For example, I'm not even going to read that because uh, there's really no point to it. But uh, yada yada, blah, blah, blah. With this change, we can now share binaries across branches, making things more efficient for our engineering systems. Exclamation point. I, I, I don't know. For our nerdy listeners, I hope that was valuable to you because it isn't to me. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you know what that means? I uh, don't. <laughs> yeah, I do. And even as a nerdy uh, uh, insider myself, uh, I couldn't care less about this. <laughs> uh, um, I suppose in if it helps for their efficiency of their engineering teams, wonderful. Um, yeah, for, we want that. I suppose as an <laughs> IT guy... Um, I can say that it will help identifying the system, legitimate system binaries, make identifying those easier versus, say, maliciously compromised ones because of malware. Um, if I can, if I can spot a Windows specific DLL versus a hacked uh, uh, virus DLL, that that will make it easier. Hmm. So, well, it's good to see it fixed. Yeah. Um, let's look at down here. Um, I do like uh, we've they've updated the snipping tool, which I did not know was even still a thing. I mean, I last episode I talked about how I still use it, but it isn't. I didn't feel that it was something they would. It, it just felt legacy to me. Yeah. So you know, last build with fifteen double oh seven, they introduced uh, Windows Shift S for screenshots mm -hmm. and. Yep. Windows Shift S is exactly that. It's snipping tool. And in fact, if you go, I uh, found out from Jen Gentleman on Twitter that if you open snipping tool and then you configure it so that it automatically draws a box or like a border box around your screenshots, that the Windows Shift S screenshot mode will automatically apply that for the, for its screenshots. Um, so it's, they advertise it as being the functionality that was built into OneNote, but it's actually that the OneNote and the snipping tool are all kind of converging into one app now, which is pretty cool. So And, and, and inking, and inking you mean, like all, uh, all that together. Yeah, all of those things are kind of converging into one, you know, set of functionality. And I'll tell you what, I have actually used Windows Shift key S as my, one of my new favorite uh, 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 keyboard shortcuts. So, nice. and those who know me uh, well enough are know that I am a diehard keyboard junkie. So, uh, anytime I get a new keyboard shortcut, I pretty much am jumping in the uh, and dancing and singing, and <laughs> you know, as excited as a kid in a candy store. So, nice. Cool. Well, I don't see anything else real poking me in the eye as far as uh, the fixes in here, unless you want to mention anything. Well, not so much for fixes per se, but uh, a couple of the quote unquote known issues slash announcements. Uh, if you are running Windows 10 mobile, um, you will want to be aware that the apps corner is being discontinued and removed from Windows 10. Um, as you may know, uh, the Kids Corner feature, which was introduced back in Windows Phone 8.1, uh, in timing for the anniversary update, they announced that they were going to kill that feature off. And of course, they recommended everybody to use Apps Corner. Well, here they are, what, six months later, and they're saying that, oh, by the way, Apps Corner is going away too. Um, and this kind of rubs me the wrong way because, first of all, Kids Corner, even though I don't have kids, was a fantastic feature. It let me actually give my phone to family members and friends and say, here you go, play around, without actually having to 
give them access to my phone. Um, so with the original Kids Corner, you're saying, and then of yeah. course with Apps Corner, um, yeah. kind of uh, grew grew it up in a way. Yeah, sort of. Except that Kids Corner worked. Apps Corner never really did. It was always kind of buggy and slow, and even though it was supposed to be more sophisticated, uh, it just didn't get the attention that it deserved. Um, so I'm actually kind of sad that they're, and plus it's just a differentiation between what is available on Windows versus Android and iOS. And I'm, I'm always a little sad and upset when I see unique features of Windows go away. Uh, always a little bummed by that. Yeah, that is, well, that's um, the way it is, I guess. Yeah, and so then a couple other things here that um, in 15.007, the Windows Hello on my Lumia uh, 950XL was fantastic. They made some changes to the way it worked, and it is much more accurate. Um, it is works better from a distance, and it was almost instantaneous much much faster than it has ever been in 007 in 007 in 014 they have now put back the animation that was missing in the previous build and unfortunately it has slowed a uh, hello down again and i'm not too happy about that um either because i was actually finally starting to use windows hello on my phone um and now I'm thinking that I'm probably going to turn it back off, which is unfortunate. And, yeah. and then the last thing that I want to highlight here is that uh, when if you use the wallet functionality, it is apparently broken on this build. So you will not be able to use tap to pay on 15014. Hmm. Now, personally, I don't use it yet because unfortunately my bank doesn't support it yet, but... Uh, um, and I know they'll fix it, obviously. So, you know, but if that's a f feature that listeners are using, hold off on this build maybe, or be prepared to pull out your credit card. Just like we had to do back in the olden days. Yeah. Of, back when we know. were all Neanderthals. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is, it is disappointing. You know, two sides to that, of course, it's like, come on, just get over it. You can... You can live with uh, not paying with your phone and yeah, exactly. the other side. Why on earth can we not do this yet? And that is, there's plenty of specific reasons why, but it is disappointing and frustrating and it is, makes it tougher to be a Windows phone enthusiast. Yeah. And you know, about that, I mean, you know, I, I will be the first to admit that uh, I get very frustrated with certain ash or aspects of uh, the the builds as, as they come out and and even of the Windows Insider program and all that and I certainly have voiced a lot of criticisms lately on Twitter um, but I also want to remind people that for as vocal as we can be about criticizing builds uh, issues and things like that remember here we are volunteering our time and effort uh, nobody's holding a gun to our head saying you have to run these Insider builds so, and certainly we don't have to be on the fast ring all the time. We can slow it down to the, uh, to the slow ring and the release preview rings. Um, so if you are a listener and you're particularly upset with, uh, with any of these builds and stuff, um, maybe take the time to back out a little bit and, and slow it down or take a break from the program. I do that myself, um, several times during the year. At least two or three months out of the year, I, I step back and I dump down to the, the uh, uh, stable build branch uh, for a while just so I can kind of take a break and refresh myself um, mentally, you know, to, to kind of get over at that those issues. So, so just That's kind wise. of throwing yeah. that out there for people. You know, it, it's, not, it's not healthy for us to engage in all of this... Uh, negativity and stuff of the builds of a bad build all the time so feel free you know obviously to step back take a break now and and then and always feel free to jump back in when you are ready for it 
And quite often when I do that, when I see the, the frustrations of going on fast ring, being fast ring for, you know, weeks or even months on end, I'll roll back to, to uh, general distribution or general release or whatever. And just at that point, it's actually kind of painful because I miss the features. Mm -hmm. And I do recognize that I don't really mind the bugs nearly as bad as I dislike losing out on those features. Yep. It isn't always the case, but it's good to go back to even just to get some uh, perspective. And then again, if fast ring really does bother you that much, don't be part of insider program or go slow ring or, or um, whatever. And, uh, or even just uh, uh, release preview, which is really where if you're running, if you're using a Windows phone, and especially if you're listening to this podcast, you should at least be running release preview at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. If you are a Windows uh, phone user still, you should at least be using the release preview ring all the time, uh, just so that you never get blocked by carriers to get the updates. All right, well, we are on a roll with um, Windows Phone here, but uh, why don't you, how do I say it? Uh, you have one more line in there that you, you added, um, oh, yep. bullet point that you wanted to maybe mention. Yeah, one last uh, announcement that they made today the uh, with the Insider Build. Um, back in October, of course, they announced the Creators Update, uh, and one of the features they announced was the My People bar. Uh, they have uh, unfortunately announced that is delayed to Redstone 3, which will come in the fall of 2017. Um, I, I've already seen a lot of uh, feedback on Twitter expressing disappointment in that. Um, I know a lot of people are looking forward to that, myself included. Um, but I would remind people that, you know, we don't have access to that today yet. Um, so it, it's kind of hard to be upset over it. It's not like I got attached to the feature and functionality and now they're ripping it away from me. You know, like they did with messaging everywhere. And no, I'm not bitter yeah. about that still. Wait, yes, I am. But um, <laughs> Exactly. But, <laughs> but let's not dwell. Um, my people, you know, they haven't introduced that yet beyond just, you know, hey, a mock-up demo they did in that presentation. So, you know, let's hold off on that. I would rather they release this when it's a more robust functionality. And if I'm guessing, and this is just speculation here, but if I'm guessing, I think that it, the timing is also related to the acquisition of LinkedIn being completed. I have a feeling, as just a sneaky suspicion, that uh, the My People bar that we see in Redstone 3 will probably also integrate with LinkedIn. Hmm. Just well, a guess. Just mm -hmm. like it did with Windows Phone <laughs> yep. a long time ago. Exactly. But for, for, for a different reason. I mean, it, it, yep. obviously, Microsoft didn't own LinkedIn at that point. Yep. Well, when I was, what I saw of my people, I, I would got, got a little bit cynical because it really didn't seem that valuable to me. I mean, I saw the potential, but I really just defaulted back to, oh, I don't know. Haven't we been doing this on mobile and phone for a long time? Exactly. Similarly, well, and I think that that's for us that have been longtime mobile fans. I think that it's a, it's like, oh, hey, they're finally bringing some functionality of mobile to the desktop and trying to promote that, which I think is a good thing, and I'm I'm glad I'm excited to see it come. Yeah. So. Well, continuing on with mobile, you can now again buy Lumias in the Microsoft Store, uh, in the U.S. at least. Yes. So. It so three Lumias, you've got the 950, 950XL, and the 550. And as the article on the site states pretty clearly, don't buy the 550. And I, I do agree with that. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But then again, if you just need a really cheap phone, well, uh, still don't buy the 550. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you need a cheaper phone, buy the 650 instead. Or even the 640 is still around Absolutely, somewhere. Absolutely, yeah. If you can find... Actually, I recommend the 640 and the 640XL over the 650, personally That's, speaking. Yeah. It, the, it's a faster processor in the 640. Yeah. Um, and I think a half a gig more RAM. I don't know. It's yeah, been a long time like since I've spec'd out these things. But, yep. um, so, but, but then, of course... Oh, good. But, of course, there are other phones in the Microsoft Store, which are not Lumia's. You can get the Alcatel Idle 4S, of course, which is only 470 bucks. And um, I'm actually 
le leaning towards this, I think my wife needs my 950 here pretty soon. And I may use that as an excuse to get a new phone. As cheap as this is, as less as, as on Microsofty or uh, on Lumia as it is, I, I do like this device, even if, since it's been out a little bit. Even Well, I'll tell uh, you what, I'm actually interested in it um, for a slightly different reason. Um, even though it's a, a cheap VR headset, I'm interested in picking up the Idol 4S more, be not so much because of the mobile, but because of the VR headset it comes with. And the fact that, you know, Windows 10 P on the PC is going to be or pushing and introducing Windows Holographic uh, as part of Creator's Update. So I'm interested to see if that same headset is going to play well with that functionality. Mm -hmm. so. That isn't something I really thought much about. It really wasn't playing into my buying decision, but then again, I haven't officially pulled the trigger on this thing yet. And we'll see another six, seven episodes uh, from now, I might still be toying with the idea. God, I hope not. <laughs> I have pretty much given up on the Elite X3. I do not feel I need a device that big. I do not certainly do not want to spend that much money on it. And by the time it does get cheap to the point I might be satisfied with it. It's going to be too old. Uh, and it's, it, I don't, I don't need that. But then again, why would we be doing this if we didn't <laughs> need it? <laughs> so, yep. And but, I, I, I'm interested in the X3, but you're right. It's too expensive. Um, I think more than the phone itself, I'm interested in the laptop dock or display dock that it, that, or accessory for it. Um, and I would think about getting that and pairing it even with my 950 XL. Mm -hmm. So for continuum, so that would that is very intriguing. That uh, draws me in. Another thing that's drawing me in, in a odd way, more just like a curious way, is Fujitsu. Fujitsu is <laughs> they launched uh, 18 uh, different Windows 10 devices on the what day was that i guess that was uh 17th what was that tuesday yeah I think and so. um there's a few different devices in here but really most notably especially for me was this six inch displayed sure looks like a phone but it's a mini tablet it runs full windows 10 uh you i mean you can you can tell from the layout too it, it's very small <laughs> you know task bar and and um uh icons on the side it's it's uh i don't know what do you think of this thing i think it's curious i think it's an interesting experiment to, sh to uh, say the least but uh i think that uh you know announcing this as kind of a rather odd uh configuration along with 17 other devices i don't know to me it's kind of uh kind of suspicious of fujitsu just doesn't have a clue what they want to try to market right now so they're just throwing paint on the wall and hoping something sticks i don't well, know in this in this case i'm not even like there's too many devices for me to even go down the list and look oh, exactly. at exactly I, I could let alone I actually talk about on the it. show so if that awesome device is in there that fits my need perfectly, I probably won't even know it exists. I mean, it, it'll just get, just get, you know, I, I don't know how they're, it's like you said, they don't know what they're doing. And even if they did six devices, you know, that's still probably overkill. But um, I think then you'd have probably a better spread of what these different devices could do for you. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to dwell on this. I'm sure you could dig in deeper. Go to the site and you can you can uh, read all about the uh, 18 uh, different devices from Fujitsu that was that were announced on Wednesday, Tuesday, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's keep going. Uh, there was a firmware update for the Surface Studio and the Surface Pro 4, but sadly not Aaron's uh, Surface Book. Uh, do you know what's going on with that? Um, yeah, it looked like they released a, surface, a firmware update for Surface Studio that uh, so I guess addresses some power management issues and some uh, some issues with Wi-Fi uh, res and uh, kind of uh, when it, whatever the device would wake up 
it makes it wake up faster and then it kind of addresses some Wi-Fi performance issues, I guess. Uh, and then the Surface Pro 4 includes a few of the same similar updates to it. So I'm kind of expecting that there will be a book update coming too, but maybe it's just not ready just yet. Um, but the interesting piece in this news isn't the firmware releasing. It's that the um, uh, Surface Pro 4 release notes have a comment about it, about a future product feature coming soon. Uh, and of course they don't reveal what that feature is. Um, but if I had to guess, I would wager that that has to do with the um, battery performance uh, functionality that is in this new build. Um, I think it maybe you know, it's setting it up to have that functionality be enabled right at launch, if, if I were to make a guess on it. Um, or, you know, we know that uh, there's a hardware announcement right around the corner here over the next few months. Maybe something is going to come with those new hardware that is going to be brought back to the Surface Pro 4. I guess we'll find out soon enough, but I do think it's interesting that they called that out. That is quite uh, compelling, intriguing, uh, even to someone who doesn't really, you know, I don't use either of those devices, but that's odd. That's that's cool. Worth noting, obviously. Yeah, I mean, they obviously thought so. And I mean, it's not the kind of thing you would expect to see in release notes for firmware. Yeah, that is true. That's quite, that's funny. I kind of thought it would have been something maybe embedded, you know, somewhat that, that they just found accidentally. Yep. But, uh, hmm. Well, moving on, uh, as far as services, one service, which was never really that uh, prevalent, is getting retired February 28th. And I just received the email a few, well, a few hours ago now, but it's basically about the cash community or the cash uh, app being, well, ended. And the OneClip app basically kind of merged into cash and cash was a uh, just a really good way to, for people to, well, as Microsoft states, it was a great way for Microsoft to learn of the challenges that people were having with managing and like organizing their work. So um, they're basically saying it's it's done. Uh, quote: Moving forward, we won't develop a cash. We won't develop cash as a standalone product anymore. We will shut down the cash service on the 28th of February, 2017. Where is this going? Where else have we seen this? And where do you see, where are we going to see it again, do you think? So, well, we already know that uh, Cortana is uh, being expanded to bring this uh, uh, continue experiences across devices functionality. Um, we know that that's kind of been announced already, and we can see signs of that throughout uh, mobile and uh, desktop builds today. Um, so we know that that functionality is is on the way uh, and it's partially there already, but they're going to be expanding on that. I think that that is part of the functionality, uh, but I think what I heard as a rumor somewhere, and uh, I don't know if, uh, if, uh, if it was on MS Power User or if it was on one of the other sites, but uh, speculating that all of the one clip uh, cache functionality was eventually going to be integrated into Windows directly. Uh, and if that's the case, I hope that we'll probably see that in Redstone 3, maybe. Nice. So, that would be good, especially just picking up, uh, you know, working on something on your on your mobile uh, or maybe and jumping on the laptop to work on that continually, continue with that, and then maybe move into the desktop and having that all there. Um, and there were some aspects of that available. Boy, now I'm forgetting which build that was. I think it was uh, 007 that talked about, uh, boy, I really don't remember exactly now, so I don't want to mislead people, but the the, the potential for uh, for doing that, for everything to pop up, not just um, as far as your favorites in Edge or anything like that, there you open tabs, but the actual like uh, uh, files that you were working on and so on. But do you, where did where did I hear that, Aaron? Isn't that new? <laughs> it, yeah, it is. It's, uh, I think it was part of either 15.002 or 007. 
they both released so closely together it is kind of hard to keep the release notes straight and they both had a ton of stuff in them so uh, but yeah it was certainly right here on this last couple of builds mm -hmm. all right well moving on we do not want to leave out uh our beloved normal co-host andy's uh topic of his main topic of interest gaming uh a couple things beam is uh, officially launching their new site so that's a, a good thing beam of course is what microsoft acquired which allows uh gaming to be broadcast streamed and uh it's a big thing for people that care about those things and i'm not really one of them aaron you have a better insight more insight into this than i do i would imagine um I don't know if it's really a better insight so much as just a, another piece of speculation I have. Um, I know when they announced this uh, improvements, uh, they made it very clear that this functionality is going to be embedded into uh, Windows 10 across Xbox and mobile and PC. And of course, they're going to have the apps that are uh, available on iOS and Android. But um, but they're they're putting this functionality everywhere they can um, but making calling out the fact that it's going to be specifically integrated into windows uh, 10 itself and part of me just wonders out loud if maybe the reason why they aren't uh, as they don't seem to be as concerned about whether or not they upset playstation users of beam um, if there are any I'm not even really sure how all of that works today but um, but they don't seem to be worried about expanding into the PC or and PlayStation mark excuse me the PlayStation market not the PC market and I wonder if that's because maybe they plan on expanding the service to not simply be games uh, if maybe they will try to compete with um, Periscope and Facebook live and in, that's Instagram stories uh, even potentially YouTube itself. Um, I wonder if maybe they're going to do something like that uh, long term, uh, because and because it'll be on Windows 10, it'll be available to you know 400 million plus uh, users and growing. Uh, so maybe that's something that they can even introduce as a business feature down the road um, for the enterprises who want to be able to stream you know uh, business content out. Who knows what they could do with it uh, if they uh, do decide to expand beyond gaming and uh, and see where they can go with it. Well, I think th I love the concept of having this available to stream things and not just gaming because I, I don't really care about that. But Blab, for example, which was a kind of a it it. it it created its own market or not its own market it created its own niche it, it was it was a new product and people loved it and when it when it ended it it left a pretty big gap to fill personally i really miss that and i think beam could do so well for that it has the potential to to fill that gap again and expand upon it blab obviously was quite public and it wasn't um it wasn't something that enterprise would necessarily take on, but I think having a paid version of Beam, or even just like a you know private version of it, to where uh, that is how a large company would broadcast to its people instead of just like what would you do put put uh, you know thousand people on a Skype call or something you know that's just ridiculous. Uh, but having something like Beam to broadcast well whatever they need to powerpoint presentations and whatever there's different things that'll do that now anyway but well the funny part my my quandary my concern with this is that if beam is going to be so good for gaming game streaming and beam may want to be that enterprise solution i think the branding is going to be pretty tough i think they might have to change the branding a little bit keep beam as the gaming part and maybe in, um, introduce or integrate the technology of beam into some other enterprise service Let's just say microsoft teams or something i don't know what exactly and that's kind of where i was going with it was you okay. know how can can they is beam something that they could integrate some of that technology into other products and services that they use that might expand on what they can offer today 
Mm -hmm. So it will be interesting to see where this goes uh, moving forward. Well, speaking of not moving forward, speaking of backward compatibility, we've got a few new games that have been announced that, not new games, but announced a backwards compatibility for the Xbox One. Tekken 6, Midway, Arcade Origins, and Mutant Storm Empire, uh, which have been Xbox 360 games. I don't know how old these are, but they're not new. They, of course, uh, they're coming to Xbox One compat backwards compatibility. This is great news. This is good. Andy would be happy about this. I don't know much about it, but I did see one name pop out at me, which I recognized. That was Tekken 6. Of course, I haven't played Tekken 6, but I remember playing Tekken 2 and Tekken 3 and Tekken Tag uh, on friends' computers back, or gaming consoles, I should say, back uh, right in the my high school and after high school. And I have very fond memories of that game. And I know it'll be one of the first games that I'll probably pick up if and when I ever finally get an Xbox One. Um, do you have anything to add to that before we finish up here, uh, Aaron? Uh, no, nothing really to add on that one. Okay. <laughs> well, Aaron does have uh, App of the Week, and we have, we've been doing, um, Andy had the idea to do App of the Week. We've been doing that. And of course, if you have suggestions for App of the Week, you should email email Andy, uh, Andrew at mspoweruser.com, or you could email me if you want to for any reason, I suppose. But Aaron, what is your app of the week you've uh, brought us? Uh, my app of the app pick of the week is Series Tracker by Xgeno Software. Um, this application is a universal app on mobile and uh, PC, and I think it might be available on couple of the others I'll double check here while I'm talking about it uh, but it is a, a TV app that uh, can track all the sh all your favorite shows and stuff um, and integrates with the uh, tracked.tv uh, service uh, so it's a great way to synchronize you know between your devices on uh, all the different shows that you watch uh, I actually use it for myself to track all the episodes of the many shows that my wife and I watch and just to kind of keep track of where we're at. So it's, it's a pretty good app. It's very fast. It just received a big update. Uh, I think maybe, maybe a few weeks ago, start about at the start of the month, really uh, in time for the new year. And it's, it's a beautiful app, uh, very well designed. Uh, and the designer or the developer rather uh, puts a lot of effort and attention into making this app work. And, so nice and coincidentally two episodes ago episode 29 we had an app that was very similar i would say it's a competitor to this but go back and listen to the end of 29 if you want to hear about a, a comp to compare and contrast these two but by all everything i've heard they are both very good and i don't use either one that is about it. Aaron again thank you so much for joining joining me on this. I know Andy uh Andy was pretty worried we wouldn't be able to get a show out, and I'm glad I was able to re relieve him of, of that stress at least. Oh, my and pleasure. That you could could join him, and I know Aaron, you you know Andy, and I know your heart goes out to what he's got going on right now. Absolutely, too, so. I was just talking with him earlier, and that sounds like it's a really tough experience, especially with everything else that has happened to him over the past few years, and uh, definitely my prayers are with him. Yeah, so certainly give a little shout out or reach out to Andy if you wish and uh, help boost him up a little bit if you'd like. He, I know he he would appreciate knowing that we care about him. So that is it for this episode, everyone. Thanks for listening again to the MS Power User Podcast. You can follow the site on Twitter at MS Power User. And of course, you'll find out when the new episode is available, which really is every Friday morning for the most part. We record this pretty much every Thursday. My name is Vernon E.L. Smith, and of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Vernon E.L. Thanks again to our ho our co-host, uh, guest, guest co-host, uh, Aaron Hall. Aaron, tell us again where they could find you online and uh, maybe why they would want to follow you. Uh, best place to find me is on Twitter, at Good Things, the number two life. Uh, and... If you like IT information or just Windows and uh, Microsoft in general, uh, I 
don't consider myself a, uh, you know, like a deep insider resource, but uh, I am a technical resource and happy to help out anyone that uh, needs help. Well, there are two very specific things that I value for value you for, Aaron, in addition to being a good friend, but that you definitely know an awful lot about the latest builds of Windows. There's no question about it. And you also have a very, very good balance and and your logic <laughs> your logic is strong <laughs> and you don't let things get really whip people up into a some some people get really whipped up into an emotion. Uh, over what's going on with Microsoft and insider builds and things like that. And you have a very good metered, balanced mentality over that. And I really appreciate it when you pull back the reins on something that's going nuts and say, hold on, people, this is reality. Let's get back to it. Uh, you got a lot of value there. I appreciate that. <laughs> that's it, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful week. Take care.